study was that anyone would be clever enough to invent today's much more advanced super weapons. Bombs that make explosions like this one seem puny by comparison. This house is empty now, but once it was the home of a mathematician called Stanislav Ulam. In it, he had a remarkable idea, an idea which transformed the world. He seems to have had it looking out of this window. The idea was how to make the H-bomb. Before the last war, there was an exodus of important mathematicians and physicists from Europe to the United States. The cleverest of them came here to Los Alamos, a top secret laboratory in New Mexico, to work on what was to become the atomic bomb. The isolation and national importance of this mountaintop was to make it the perfect setting for a titanic clash of egos. The first atomic bomb was round. It consisted of a central core of plutonium packed around with high explosive. The idea was to use the conventional explosive to create an inward explosion or implosion, compressing the plutonium inside from the size of a grapefruit to about the size of a plum, creating the conditions for nuclear fission. It was an idea, in part, of the Hungarian mathematician Johnny von Neumann, who was probably the cleverest person then alive. Something about it both quickly and then continuously. In other words, we need more training in science on all levels in college. Nobody could quite believe Johnny von Neumann because the things he could do were so completely amazing. Bill, do you think you might get into that sort of field? Now, this particular day, in fact, the day prior to this one, uh, a young mathematician who subsequently has become a famous person had come in with several colleagues and we were talking about a problem with which he was grappling and he was getting nowhere and asked our help. Well, none of us was able to do anything with it analytically. So he said, well, the heck with it. I'm going to take a computer or Frieden or Marchand or Monroe home tonight and I'm going to calculate a few special cases. And fine. He did, and the next morning he came in at 5.30 looking awful. He had bags under his eyes, he was fatigued, he was unshaved. He was, in fact, in very bad way, but he had triumphed. He had calculated the first five cases, and he was busy telling us about this when who should bust in but Johnny from Los Alamos. And he said, well, what's new, fellas? And we said, oh, well, so-and-so has been busy with the following idea, and he's in trouble with it. And he said, well, let's see what it's like. And he tried for a couple of minutes, and he said, no, he said, that's sort of intractable analytically. Let me see what's doing with this thing numerically. Let me evaluate a few cases. So he did, in about one minute, he threw his head back, and he said, well, 16, 17, and you could hear the numbers rolling through his, his, his head. You could actually hear them. He was mumbling them. And in about a minute, he did the first case, and maybe a minute and a quarter the second, and a minute and a half the third, and two minutes the fourth. And he came then to the crucial case, the one which this fellow had spent his whole night working out. And this chap was very clever, at, and he listened closely to von Neumann as he was rolling through N equals 5. And when he judged he was about halfway through, he recognized a number, and he waited an instant, and then he said, 26.75. And you could just see von Neumann kind of come to a shuddering halt. And he said, huh? And this boy said, 26.75, Professor von Neumann. And von Neumann said, just a minute. And he got very nervous, and he began to compute again, and you could hear the tempo going up much more than it had before. And after another minute, he said, 26.75. Yes, he says, that's right. And whereupon this fellow ran out of the room because he couldn't stand it any longer. And I made childish chatter trying to keep von Neumann distracted while he paced up and down nervously saying to himself, how could that guy have possibly done that? What trick? And after an hour or so, we finally told him. But you must also remember that the scholarships help you only at the end of this process. And that before this, one needs very good training in secondary schools. Otherwise, you may never... Johnny von Neumann has been called the Mozart of 20th century mathematics. The really interesting question, though, is whether he was also the true-life model for Dr. Strangelove. 
or whether that honour belongs to another Hungarian at Los Alamos, Edward Teller. Many people have wondered how Johnny von Neumann could think so fast. The nuclear weapons programme, where cleverness was all, was a breeding ground for giant, out-of-control personalities. At the time, these were the most powerful and influential people in the world. This explains a lot, because what you like, you do well. And he liked thinking, not just in mathematics. He liked thinking in the clear and complete manner of mathematicians. In top secret wartime Los Alamos, the word computer usually referred to a type of person, a woman, who operated a calculating machine. And there weren't nearly enough of them. A major bottleneck in the nuclear weapons program was developing in these numerical typing pools. Von Neumann spotted it and realized that a completely radical solution was required. He began traveling around the country on his favorite means of transport, railway trains, looking for machines that might be pressed into service to speed up the atomic bomb calculations. Finally, on a station platform in Maryland, fate intervened. A young army captain called Hermann Goldstein who trained as a mathematician, recognized von Neumann, went up to him and, quite by accident, introduced him to the digital computer. I egotistically thought I would go up and talk to this great man since nobody was around him. We had a while to wait. I was bored. So I went over and he said who I was and he was very polite. And began to ask me what I was doing. And I told him, well, I was engaged in building a, a, an all-electronic digital computer. And that interested him a little bit. And he said, how fast does this thing go? And I said, it does 300 multiplications a second. And that changed him from being polite to being intensely interested. And who was the the greater president of the society. Hermann Goldstein was to become von Neumann's right-hand man. These days, in token of a grateful nation's esteem, he works in a historic 18th century building which once accommodated Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. This is a chair designed by Thomas Jefferson for his own use. It's a writing chair, isn't it? And these, looking suspiciously like electronic valves, were Benjamin Franklin's pioneering electric batteries. They, uh, they contain sulfuric acid and they're yoked together in such a way that you get a tremendous wallop from it. Is this the battery that he used to incinerate a turkey with? That's what I'm told. Goodness. It must have been quite a shock to the turkey as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Benjamin Franklin. Over in the other corner is von Neumann's contribution, the programmable computer. In the middle of the war, its remotest ancestor was being constructed at the University of Pennsylvania by two relative outsiders, Presper Eckert on the left and John Morkley on the right. The machine, which could only be programmed by plugging up a thing resembling a telephone exchange, was called the ENIAC. It had been designed to calculate range tables, mathematical aids to help artillerymen aim guns. It took a von Neumann to realize that the ENIAC could in theory solve any problem, including the Los Alamos bomb calculation. In 1945, the atomic bomb was exploded over Japan, ending the war, with the ENIAC not yet quite finished. Los Alamos was already working on something even bigger, something this time that computers would help design, the H-bomb. And like the computer, the H-bomb was to crystallize around the personality of one man, in this case, Edward Teller. I was strongly motivated, on the one hand, by my respect for knowledge, on the other hand, by my fear of the Soviets. The hydrogen bomb would burn not plutonium, like the atomic bomb, but hydrogen, like the sun, 
it was to be almost any size, small enough to go in an artillery shell, big enough to destroy a metropolis. In 1945, these giant explosions, capable of literally changing the face of the Earth and even altering the cloud cover, were, to Teller and his group, an impossible dream. Making hydrogen bombs that actually worked represented a problem so hard it should by rights never have been solved. What was required was not only the determination to do it, nor the biggest computers in the world, but nothing less than a flash of inspiration. The third European refugee fated to change the post-war world was Stan Ulam. There will be no ignorabimus in mathematics that all meaningful statements will ultimately be decided. He was a mathematician who had been brought up in the exotic but somewhat flaky cafe culture of academic Poland. While he was recovering from a serious brain operation in 1945, he played patience. He discovered that he could predict how a hand would come out on the basis of the first few moves. It led him to an entirely new statistical technique of solving problems, which he called the Monte Carlo method. And it was to prove very useful when, fully recovered, he returned to Los Alamos to work for Edward Teller. A good and clever mathematician, very uncertain of himself, and very anxious to do something important. Teller had developed what came to be called the super. Uh, his idea for the super was that you would have an atomic bomb attached to the end of a pipe filled with an isotope of hydrogen, rather the way you'd have a matchstick attached to the head of a match, the atomic bomb being the head of the match. The notion was that if you ignited this hydrogen liquid, that it would burn the way wood burns, down the length of the pipe. This, of course, happening in a fraction of a fraction of a second, and that a huge explosion would follow. But there was no certainty that the super idea would actually work. The problem was whether or not an atomic bomb could be used to set off a much larger deuterium bomb. Deuterium is a form of hydrogen. Now, mathematically speaking, what the problem comes down to is you imagine an atomic bomb here and a lump of deuterium here. Now, when the atomic bomb goes off and a shock wave goes through the deuterium and the deuterium heats up to millions of degrees, is it going to be enough for the deuterium to explode? While this was going on, Johnny von Neumann fell out with Eckert and Morkley, the originators of the ENIAC. Together, they'd been designing a much more advanced machine called the EDVAC, and in the process, the stored computer program was invented. But then, Johnny von Neumann wrote a specification for the new machine. It was to catch the imagination of the technical world. So many people heard about it and, and got in touch with me and got permission from the Ordnance Department of the Army to get copies of this that I distributed probably several hundred copies. And the idea just swept through the intellectual world. History decreed that it would be Johnny von Neumann and neither Eckert nor Morkley who would be called the father of the digital computer. Oh, these things would have fascinated Johnny. He used to love toys when he worked on... Here, 20 years on from the end of the war, a middle-aged Herman Goldstein pays a call to the vaults of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. 
As for his and von Neumann's rivals, Morkley had unwisely founded a company to exploit the new invention, a company which went bust. Eckert had merely faded into obscurity. Yes. Well, as Johnny would have said, mercy. Meanwhile, von Neumann and Goldstein had built this much more advanced machine, which was to be Johnny's most enduring monument. 20 years before, in early 1946, this was just a gleam in von Neumann's eye. It was yet to be built. The only working computer in the world was the feeble ENIAC. So it was on the ENIAC that Teller's design for the hydrogen bomb, the Super, was tested. It was the first large computer calculation ever done. The very simplified calculation represented the bomb assembly one-dimensionally, rather like a line of beads. The beads on the left represent an atomic bomb trigger. The beads on the right, hydrogen. The answer was, the super would work. But the calculation was so crude, it couldn't be relied on. I think most people don't realize that the United States, at the end of the Second World War, had about two atomic bombs. And until 1947, 19, until 1947, that's all we had. Indeed, the Cold War was approaching its height in those early years after the Second World War, and we were making various threatening gestures toward the Soviet Union, and we didn't have a nuclear arsenal to back them up. But there was still an American nuclear weapons research program, and Ulam, now working for Teller, was finding ways of applying his Monte Carlo method to the super problem. Ulam wanted to calculate the blooming of a thermonuclear explosion. He conceived that in terms of the paths that neutrons would follow as the explosion expanded. And he wanted to take cross sections in time at various points and see where a given neutron might be. That was the way he was going to do this very difficult calculation. He discovered that he could, instead of trying to follow each little particle as it went, that if at each cross section he simply threw dice, and took a, essentially a random number, that that would be close enough to, to give him a reasonable prediction of where these things went and therefore how this explosion developed. August 1949, and as a Central Asian desert quaked to an enormous explosion, the whole world changed. Now the Soviets had the atomic bomb too. President Truman wasn't told that a hydrogen bomb was possible until two months later, on October the 6th. On that date, the contents of an open letter were brought to his notice. It had been written by Edward Teller, who was furiously campaigning for funds for the super project. Teller is a man who believes that, assuming physics isn't going to be violated, that you can do anything with, with science and with technology. And to, uh, to, to think that something isn't possible is simply to say you haven't applied enough brain power to it. So he was quite sure that one way or another there would be a hydrogen bomb, and of course he was right. But the one way that there wasn't a hydrogen bomb was, was his own favorite design. The question, as before, was this. Would an atomic bomb trigger ignite a pipe of deuterium? A real-life test would take over a year to arrange, but it was exactly the sort of question which could be settled much sooner by an enormous calculation. For Neumann's computer was not yet quite ready to go, but it could be used in part. A race began between von Neumann and Ulam, who decided to compute the problem by hand with the help of roomfuls of calculating women, including his own wife, Françoise. We started at the top of the line and had to make additions, subtractions, logs, and so on. And then the figure that we had at the end went to the next line, and we went through the same process. This was just the iterative process. And at the end, at the end of the big sheet, we got a number which got transferred to another sheet. And so there we were a bunch of girls, and we were doing that. Which All was in a big room? No, we were in little offices, two or three to an office. Ulam's Monte Carlo calculation followed the fates of individual deuterium nuclei as the shockwave from an atomic explosion passed through them. He got his answer first. 
the deuterium would not ignite, the super would never work. Famously, at one point, von Neumann said to, to Ulam with, with considerable disgust, icicles are forming, meaning this explosion wasn't getting hotter, it was getting colder. It was going the wrong way. This was his vision, this was his dream, this was the only idea, uh, serious idea, that he had at that point for how to make the hydrogen bomb. And remember, he had promised the United States government that if it invested vast sums of money, uh, that there would be a hydrogen bomb, that he knew how to make one. The results on the hand calculation were announced a little earlier. When they were announced, perhaps wrongly, I did not believe them. Within a few weeks, the, the machine calculations came in, and that I had to believe. I think it may have been just uh, due to my prejudices, but I believe that the one was a method that could have been wrong, and the other one was a method where the probability of its being wrong was much smaller. Because Johnny von Neumann had done the calculation? No, because it was a computer. But, you know, by doing the calculation, by personally being the person who sat down and worked those numbers, Ulam, in a very deep psychological sense, had cleared away Teller Super. That idea was out. And he could then begin to think about other possibilities that perhaps hadn't been conceived at all. And, in fact, was thinking about how you could get bigger yields from atomic bombs when he made the crucial breakthrough, because truly Stan Ulam was the father of the hydrogen bomb, not Edward Teller. Edward Teller, as one of his friends said, was perhaps the mother, since Stan rather impregnated him with this idea, and then he developed it. He told me we were, I had come home for lunch and he was staring out of the window and told me, uh, I think I found a way to make it work. So I was just coming home for lunch. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, what work? And he said, the super. And I became very, uh, I wondered, what, do you, what really is going to happen? I was very happy that the super couldn't be built. And this horrible super weapon was not feasible and that finally we had found it. And he said, well, it'll change the world. So what exactly was Stan Ulam's idea? Well, it's still secret, so it's impossible to tell for sure. But I think it's a fairly good bet that it was something rather like this. This is how you make an ellipse. Now, this shape has some extraordinary properties. If you imagine it in three dimensions and silvered on the inside, so this is a sort of mirror, and you were to shine a light at one focus, then all that light would converge at the other focus. And if you built this three-dimensional ellipse incredibly robustly, and you set off an explosion here at one focus, then the debris from the explosion would converge in an implosion at the other focus. Now, this is an incredibly simple mathematical idea, and it's taught to people at secondary school. If this was Stan Ulam's idea, well, it contains with it two of the important ideas that were to make the H-bomb possible. Firstly, the idea of separating the atomic bomb trigger physically from the hydrogen bomb, and secondly, the idea of using an atomic bomb to create an implosion to set off the hydrogen bomb. <laughs> 
And if so, it makes a lot of sense that the idea occurred to a mathematician. He hadn't been getting along very well with Teller when he was doing those calculations. Teller didn't like the results. So I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, I'll have to go talk to Edward. Ulam came to me with a suggestion, which was not new, but which was a little related to these things. I told him this won't work. But if you change it a little in this way, then it will. The H-bomb was to work something like this. An atomic bomb at one end emits X-rays, which initiate a violent implosion in a separated secondary stage. This sets off a mass of deuterium, which in turn ignites a jacket, uranium-238. The explosion of the first test bomb, Mike, took place on the island of Aluga Lab in the Pacific. After the explosion, the island was found to have disappeared. that this is a full-size replica. This is a full-size replica of the hydrogen bomb. Exactly. This is exactly the size of each one of the 10 warheads in an MX missile. And now you've worked out how it works. Exactly. When the uh, US government in 1979 tried to block publication of my story on this, they said that I had correctly identified the three key elements of the Teller Ulam idea. Suppose this act was actually going off yeah. now. What happens to all these buildings around? Would any of them be left standing? Right now, you and I would be history. Probably right under us would be a hole the size of a large soccer stadium or football stadium. And every building you see within a mile and a half would be knocked flat to the ground. Beyond that would be a firestorm. It would be a mushroom cloud filled with the radioactive debris of all this stuff that's been pulverized and probably lethal radioactive fallout would extend at least 50 to 100 miles downwind. And how many people would be killed? Easily a third of the people on Manhattan Island by Millions. this one explosion. Millions. It had been the mind of a human being and not the computer that had found the solution to the problem. But the last laugh, as usual, went to Johnny von Neumann because the computer turned out to have applications far beyond the nuclear weapons program. It really did change the world. <laughs>